Good evening and welcome to Intellectual Publics coming to you from the Graduate Center at CUNY. I'm Ken Wissaker and director of the program. And tonight we're gonna to talk about publishing, which is a subject close to my heart. And I'd like to first offer some fulsome thanks to Chelsea Largent, a brilliant ABD at the Graduate Center who runs the program with me uh, while she writes her dissertation on contemporary femme in her um, spare time. And each year since we started this, I've tried to have a session sharing advice uh, from my other role as senior executive editor at Duke University Press, offering thoughts about how to reconceive a dissertation project as a book or how to plot one out from scratch. Uh, I've done several times as a talk in person and in the pandemic uh, Zoom mode. This year, in planning tonight's event, Chelsea suggested structuring it as we usually do with intellectual publics, as a conversation, offering more chance for the fresh and unexpected thinking. Uh, I was thrilled that the first person we thought of, uh, my friend and author Raquel Gates, was willing to join us and take the role of interlocutor. I think we're in for something really special. She'll ask questions, maybe share some of her own, stories from writing her books or those of colleagues. Uh, we'll talk until about 7.45 if Eastern. If you have questions, you should please put them in the Q&A where we can find them. Raquel Gates is Associate Professor of Film at Columbia University. Her research focuses on race and popular culture with a focus on history, theory, and aesthetics in film and television. She's the author of The Fabulous Double Negative, The Black Image in Popular Culture, uh, which came out from Duke in 2018. And her work appears in both academic and popular publications, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, Film Quarterly, as well as other journals and collections. In 2020, she was named an Academy Film Scholar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. She's currently working on her next book manuscript titled Hollywood Style and the Invention of Blackness. Please welcome Raquel and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation to be in conversation with you and um, just for the opportunity for me to actually get to ask you a whole bunch of questions that I want to ask you anyway, but that I think will um, hopefully be um, helpful and, and generative for folks who are who are tuning in. Um, so first, I mean, kind of a basic question. I have, uh, you know, like I was on the Duke University Press website and reading your extensive biography. Uh, I didn't realize you published over a thousand books. Yeah, it's probably up to like 1400 by now, the last time someone checked. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been there since the 1900s. <laughs> so there's been there's been a little ample opportunity to um, get them out, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it um, that it's interesting because if you went back and did a little slice through any period, what disciplines they were in, what the subjects were, have shifted the whole time. So it's been it's been a different adventure. It's never felt like doing the same thing over and over again. Can you um can we kick it off by just you talking a little bit about sort of what your history has been, sort of what you did coming into Duke University Press, what you do now, um, and sort of what what your role is um, as editor in terms of the process, in terms of sort of what that means for an author, especially a first time author. Yeah, I think when you hear the term editor, you picture somebody actually saying like this sentence is structured incorrectly. <laughs> and that's something I have actually little skill in. Um, uh, what we do, acquisitions editors do, is try and figure out, well, what books should be published? And then each, each singular decision, let's publish this book, then adds up to the shape of something that people think of like, oh, that's the Duke list, or that's the Fordham list, or that, and that list might be different in every area. So what the uh, economics list at Princeton is might have zero in common, might be entirely opposed to the list in political theory in terms of like who it's for or what, what the deal is. 
So we're looking for books that will likely come out a few years down the road. So you're always looking ahead. Where is some conversation going to be? Where is a field or subfield going to be? What are we going to need then? And you're trying to kind of anticipate that out. So you're kind of trying to see where conversations are going, where you could make an intervention. Uh, that was a big thing for me coming in because I started, I had a lot of friends who were in cinema studies, actually, um, Pam Mojic and mm -hmm. other people I knew from when they were grad students at Chicago. And my own background was as much anthropology as anything, but I had gotten really interested in the original wave of cultural studies of Stuart Hall and uh, De Keptage and other things back at, when I was working at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore in Chicago. And being there, I also saw how the same people picked up books from a lot of different fields and that a lot of presses were very siloed. They expected more on that Princeton model, like the economics people would just read economics, the film people would just read film. And what I saw, especially among grad students, was people reading in a very interdisciplinary way. So I came into the press wanting to do that, to be able to combine different expertises from different fields in work. And to me, that always felt sort of future oriented, you know, this the way that often when I, I can remember actually a time at Chicago where new grad students were being introduced in literature. I mean, at Duke, where new graduate students were being introduced in the literature program. And you would hear their projects and they'd have like what would have been like four different people's projects from like five years before. And you could see they'd absorbed all these different influences as undergrads. And they're like, okay, we're here to do this in the new way. Mm -hmm. And so for signing up books, I'm always looking for what's going to be that kind of new way. What, what's going to like be the place we hope the field will arrive at? And how could I support that? Mm -hmm. Most of the work I actually do, other than that kind of curatorial part, is both running the review process. So it's university press, everything goes through peer review. And then the part that I think of as the doula part, like when I explain my job, <laughs> I'll be like curator and doula, which is like helping the person get through the process of writing, writing their book. So it's really a com combination of those two and is 90% of the time. But then in the end, you're building something somebody can go, oh, you did over a thousand books. What's the shape of that as a group? Or how does that shape change over, over time? You said something uh, just now about um, sort of like thinking about gaps in the field and trying to anticipate the direction that the, the, the field is going in. Do, do you make a distinction between um, work that's innovative versus work that's trendy? Um, I'm, I don't, I don't sure about the word trendy mm -hmm. in the first place, because mm -hmm. um, that seems like a way of characterizing work you don't like, <laughs> sort of like postmodern or something. Right, right. It's like, I never knew anybody who said, oh, my work is so trendy. Mm -hmm. I've talked to a lot of people. Um, I feel that's actually a warning sign that somebody's following something they imagine is next. Like if you think, and I often make analogies to music. So if somebody was like, oh, I want to make something trendy, so it should have that speeded up sound of the right. TikTok videos, I'd be like, oh, that's not a person who knows where things are going. That's mm -hmm. a person who is trying to imitate where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think not everything, not everything new is worthwhile. Not everything new pays off. And there are lots of things that are very traditional in their methods that make something really important new possible. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think back to like uh, Academy director, museum director, Jackie Stewart's first book, which California published, the methods were known methods, mm -hmm. but the book was entirely pioneering at the same time. So that sometimes something is new because of the way it's written, like, oh, this style, like Alexis Gums, 
whoever thought of writing back to an author by like making a poem, making a book of poems about what you thought while you were reading. Sometimes it's about the actual conceptual ideas, the theories of themselves. Sometimes it's the methods. Sometimes it's just some combination of that. And sometimes it's really like we've needed work. And I think Jackie's book was a good example of that. We've needed work like this for a long time. And finally, somebody's come along who's recognized it and really done it. Mm -hmm. Is there, I mean, part, part of the reason I'm, I'm asking is because I, like a million years ago when I was in grad school, I remember this this sense when people were sort of proposing dissertation topics and um, and then thinking about, you know, the ways that your dissertation is theoretically going to be a good chunk of your book or, you know, um, but I remember this moment where people were sort of, um, there were the things that individuals felt really interested in, but there was also this moment of but like, where's the field going or what's going to sort of get me, what's going to be interesting? Am I writing about something that people are going to care about? And, and that's why I'm, I'm sort of, um, you know, asking you, is there, is there a way for authors to discern, I think, particularly between revising from the dissertation to into the first book, um, to sort of find some kind of balance in terms of anticipating sort of what's come where the field is going um, versus and trendy isn't the right word but you know in some ways like hopping on whatever topics seem I mean there's certain topics that get kind of hot you know in, yeah, in certain sure. fields um, and then they're not after a while um, but is there a way or do you have any advice I guess for authors in terms of trying to strike some kind of some kind of balance or find some kind of I don't know intellectual integrity um, in terms of their topics. Well, you know, maybe I'm too simplistic about this, and I'm sure it doesn't really work for all disciplines, but I, I think a lot about the difference between the object. Mm -hmm. What are you writing about? Oh, this set of films, this, um, this set of migrant workers, this set of historical documents, the objects. So like you could say now, um, the constitutional conventions projects, the colored conventions projects, that's a really big project that needed to be done. That as an object, you could say, oh, that's happening now. It won't be as surprising 15 years from now if somebody starts, finds another one and adds it in as it is at the beginning. But it, um, so there's that part, which is what are you writing about? And then there's the part of like, well, what do you have to say? Mm. So that usually I feel like people are reading books or the books become successful more because of what someone has to say than the topics they chose. Mm -hmm. So you could choose a very trendy topic and handle it in a really boring way. And I believe me, <laughs> over the years, I've seen a lot of like, um examples of that where it's like oh wow reggaeton and blah 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 and then you look at how the person's doing it and it's like oh is this like 50 sociology or something it's mm -hmm. not there's nothing that matches the excitement you have about reading about the topic mm -hmm. with the ideas that go with it mm -hmm. or you could have something that feels like this is who's going to be interested in this topic anyway and then the person's ideas are so great that everybody jumps right in. The book that that's happened with us most recently, um, which is closing in on for first book selling almost 10,000 copies, is Max LeBoyron's Pollution is Colonialism. Mm. And, you know, here's somebody who runs a lab for taking plastics out of fish, who's a Matisse scholar, science studies scholar. It's in Memorial University in Newfoundland. So it's not like people are like, oh, maybe I'll start a lab to right. take plastics out of fish or any of the things. But the ideas and the way that the book makes you think differently, it's like, oh, lots of people could use that. Mm -hmm. So it's I think that when you're writing the dissertation, part of the difficulty is um, and I've thought of this as kind of a um, positivist remainder. You're looking for a niche of something that hasn't been written about. Oh, no one wrote on that filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Nobody wrote on these early writings of whoever. 
And so then that seems like a good dissertation topic. And how that works to then have a new idea is sometimes just a kind of coincidence. Sometimes the object is the affordance, like, wow, if I hadn't taken this topic, I never would have come up with these ideas. Other times it feels like the objects are in the way. You know, mm -hmm. I got nothing to say more about this. I did everything there was. There's, I wish I made me think of some new idea, but. And so part of like the that transition from the dissertation to book is trying to figure out, well, which is the, you know, not to be all decluttery since I am not, but like which parts of it give you joy, which is the part that you can really run with. And mm -hmm. which is the part like, well, I guess I signed up for this. So I'm, I came in with it. I guess I'm going out with it, you know, which isn't very useful. In some ways, it I mean, it also feels like that transition from dissertation to first book is also about the transition in identity from graduate student to author, you know, mm -hmm. um, as, as a grad student, you know, you, you, you see this so, so often where like you read these papers and it's, you know, there is a gap in the literature. No one has talked about this before, which is never true, right? Like there's right. probably nothing that nobody's talked about. You just haven't read it, but, but that feels very much kind of like the thing that you do in grad school, try to like stake your claims and find like the undiscovered object. Um, and I like what you said about it's, you know, it becoming more about how you say it, about sort of advancing a way of thinking as opposed to the specific things that you're thinking about. And I, I think that 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 shift isn't just a shift in writing or an argumentation. It really is, I think, a, like a shift in, in sort of identity and confidence, right? Where you're not like trying to find the thing, the interesting object that's going to impress your classmates or, you know, your, your, your professor, but really trying to articulate a voice of, of your own, um, which is... Which, which is, is hard. hard. Which is hard, right. I, I, I agree. I, I think of that no one's done X as a kind of pushing off, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's very often used in proposals. And it where my mind always goes is, is that really right? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I had, we, we were looking at something last week on post-colonial Derrida. And the person was saying like, well, Really, there hasn't been a kind of full coming to terms of post-coloniality in Derrida. Mm -hmm. And then they list two exceptions. And immediately, I start thinking of other exceptions. So instead of thinking about the person's proposal, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about ways that, oh, that can't really be true. Sure. And then start thinking of other things, which isn't helpful at all. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is it's one... I used to, I feel like when you're a grad student, you're not encouraged to have your own ideas. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're encouraged to quote things that show you've read things. So mm -hmm. also, as I've long pointed out, then you won't get in trouble. Like, <laughs> don't blame me. That's Butler. Right. They right. said that, not mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that this is the first is a way of avoiding actually getting to, well, what do you want to say? Mm -hmm. The same way I want to contribute to the conversation about blank mm -hmm. is it's mm -hmm. like, what's your contribution? Just mm -hmm. get to that. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's the hardest thing is one, being that new person that everybody's waiting to hear your contribution. So I feel like, and maybe this is part of the doula part of the job, but I feel a big part of my job, and this is definitely gendered and raced and ethnicized is convincing people that they could be the theorist mm -hmm. you know that theorists aren't like some dead french guys white guys you mm -hmm. know that theorists could be you and that the theorist it means having a theory or having an idea and that's why people are going to read the book mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and i think that's very very hard to get from that one form of writing to um, the next. So I, I try and encourage people to, to write not up like the way you do in grad school for the professors or senior people. And it's hard if you're in a tenure track job and you're writing for tenure or you're writing to get a job out of a postdoc to have that confidence. So I, I kind of think of it as writing in the voice of the person you haven't become yet. 
Mm. You have to kind of anticipate the person that people are going to be all excited about. Like, mm. oh, that's Raquel Gates. I read her book. That was really smart. Mm -hmm. But you can't really think that way. It's hard to think that way while you're still like, is this paragraph right? Do right. I really need this? Is this going to get me tenure? Is this going to get, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so I think there's there's two things I'd, I'd sort of maybe um, break apart. One, I think you're absolutely right, which is the, the, the sort of self-confidence thing I was thinking about a professor in grad school who kind of, you know, made a, a really funny snarky comment one time that said only, you know, like uh, only old white men write these grand theories of the world because only an old white man would think that he had the world figured out. Uh, and I, you know, it always kind of stuck with me. Um, and so I think there that's, that's a, a part of it. Um, but I also think the, I, I'm wondering too about the format of like the proposal and the weight that I think a lot of especially first time authors place on the proposal because some of you know you write a book proposal and there's always that question you know and whatever whatever line it is you know after like what's your what is your intended audience and you're like it is upper level undergrads and grads do, you know I don't know whatever you say um but then also was like the kind of what is the point of like why does this book matter within the field which i do think sort of it, it not to say the problem is the form but i do think there's this way that in trying to sort of pitch the book or sell the book um authors tend to sort of overemphasize the gaps and where this fits in and the problem that this is solving as opposed to um the idea of like here's the way of thinking that i'm trying to advance um I know we chatted about this a little bit before, but can you, I mean, what, in terms of, in terms of someone who's looking for the next great book, are you interested in the proposal? What, like, what needs to be in a proposal to sort of catch your attention? Um, or can this be a conversation? Um, because I think this is also sort of a thing that a lot of folks, um, you know, don't, don't know, or don't, don't think about in much detail. I think the proposal has been way oversold. I think it's a, it started as a kind of um, commercial form in the UK for like uh, commercial publishers like Paul Grave or Routledge or Wiley that were doing hundreds and hundreds or thousands really of books a year and had people just kind of not disinterested, but a lot of people were moving them through who didn't really care about what they were and just wanted the copy to paste from one place to another mm -hmm. um, and needed short forms um, explaining why books would replace other books. And it's really something that sort of fits best a textbook, you know. Mm -hmm. If this is going to replace, you know, intro to film then why is it better than the one i'm using mm -hmm. and that's a good question but it's not a really good question for most of our work mm -hmm. so if i to me i i know a, a lot of my colleagues actually like proposals they like seeing how someone thinks about their work i find i think of it as it's it's just a means to an end which is to get an editor interested and that could happen lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. I think you and I went out to lunch. Mm -hmm. You told me about your project. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, wow, that's really exciting. I'd like to work with you on it. And then, remember it though. That's not exactly what happened. Go on, finish. Yeah. finish, finish no, it, tell me I'll what tell really my version. happened. I, <laughs> so no, part of why I'm asking is because I had a I had a very different project in mind for, for the uh -huh. first book, which was going to be more sort of directly um drawn from the dissertation um and we went out and we went out to lunch um and had a really lovely lunch we were chatting and you're like oh that's really interesting and you should send it um but then i started talking about this other idea that i had that i was planning to work on later after i did this and that's and for what i remember that's when you're like no 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 wait wait what is that what like negativity wait that that's really interesting like what and then we started talking about about that and the, the reason i'm i'm mm -hmm. i'm gently nudging and pushing back is is because whatever proposal i had whatever formal proposal it was that wasn't what the book was on like the the book the book project came out of 
like a casual conversation towards the end of the official lunch to talk about the proposal that I was going to submit. Um, right. And so it's it's funny because even now when I and that's what and you know that's what that's what we that's what we did. Um, but even you know subsequently like someone said well can i see your book proposal for double negative and i was like oh i don't i don't know that i have a book proposal mm -hmm. i have a I have a book proposal for this other book that i ended up not writing um and um but i also th so the other thing i'll say is you know i appreciate you saying that the you know you think the book proposal is sort of over over hyped but I also benefit from the privilege of living in New York and being able to like go out to lunch with you and sort of like knowing where your office is and being able to like low key maybe stalk you and like sort of pop up and, and things like that. But that's not <laughs> like hi, I'm at your door. Um, but that's that's not the reality for for most folks, obviously, who are not living in the same city where um, the editor that they'd like to have a conversation with um, is sort of located. So beyond the the con like the conference and that's also assuming that the editor you want to work with goes, goes to that to conference. Your conference um what do what should people do to you know like right. what i guess what do they do beyond sort of mm -hmm. submitting the really formal proposal that might not actually be the most generative way to have a conversation about their ideas well one thing that's great about that story and thank you for remembering for me um is thinking about it as a process and you know today i had a conversation with somebody at princeton who after the book was under contract and it's been through two rounds of reviews has realized it's actually two different books and the whole problem they were having making it cohere was because they had were trying to get two things and this is their second book but two different stories into one book and as soon as it was broken apart, it worked really, really well. And it was much easier to make the whole thing convincing. And I've, one of the problems I've had with the kind of last decade of proposal push is it happens too soon. Mm -hmm. So if it comes directly after the dissertation, and that's like the first project, that could be the launching point for a conversation. Lots of times I get proposals, and I'm like, there's something here, but it's not, does that really, is that really the form it should take? Mm -hmm. So certainly sending someone a proposal saying, oh, let's meet at whatever the conference is and then talking and then asking, is this the best way for it to happen? That That is, that is a process, mm -hmm. but you have to go in assuming it's going to be a process. Mm -hmm. Other times you might come in like, as you did, like thinking one book and then, oh, maybe it's another book. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot of the weight of the pandemic lifting because I really felt challenged by the other part of your question over the last few years because in a way, like, oh, there's Zoom. Couldn't you make a Zoom appointment with people? Well, you can make some Zoom appointments and there's, I would say, rarely a day goes by when I don't have an author or would-be author Zoom appointment. Mm -hmm. but that's not as casual a start as I was at Asian American Studies two weeks ago and I have an eight o'clock, a nine o'clock, a 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Somebody writes with an interesting project. You know, I can, if it sounds like there's potential, I can give them the 10 o'clock on Friday, mm -hmm. 11 o'clock. If I'm taking out 10 o'clock on Friday this week or something for Zoom, then it's like, ooh, what am I going to do my act, the rest of the work? So mm -hmm. it is more, um, it's a lot better that we're coming out of the pandemic and there's space for that. I think that might come from, you know, what's the best way of getting to different editors one might want to work with. Um, we have several options, one of which is to put things through the way we ask people to on our website. People write to me all the time not paying attention to that i don't think it makes sense sometimes people will write and say oh i'm writing on this topic is that something the press could be interested in but they haven't said enough to actually say anything it's like yeah we could be but i won't <laughs> it's sort of like a wasted email right. and it's like oh get a little the nice thing about the proposal is it forces you to get a little more in mm -hmm. but i think often that could be done in two or three paragraphs in an email. Mm -hmm. 
and you know with an idea of oh i'm going to be in new york or i'd love to set up a zoom and talk about this or i have my formal stuff that i could submit through the website but i want to write first just so you would notice it mm -hmm. in fact for us the things that are formally submitted through the website have the most complete response rate <laughs> compared oh. to like people who email me or other forms of like you know trying to get attention because we have a meeting once a week where we go through all the things that were submitted and do we solicit this is this but i think one of the tricky things is timing hmm. because um there are people i may meet while they're still grad students Mm -hmm. just meeting them at a conference talking to them or meet them at a talk and then keep up with them and then i know i'm going to be interested in what they're working on but there are people who submit formally and i'm like wow great idea that sounds really cool what do you have and it's basically what i saw mm -hmm. it's like oh so when do you think you'll have enough that I could send it out for review? Right. Oh, right. a year and a half. And I'm like, great. Well, but I just kind of, <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I think also I remember sending out, you know, proposals. Um, it's good to know that you all meet at like the regularity of your meetings to go over those. I always felt like you send it. I, I, I never really believed anyone actually read them on the other end. I don't know. Maybe that's my own skepticism. So it's um, that is that is a, a good thing to know. Like you send things off. You just kind of assume they go into a black hole. Um, but that's how do you have a sense of how many like just for, how many proposals do you get in a month? Oh, boy. Um... I would say there are days when I get five or 10 things a day mm -hmm. sent the way we ask people not to send them as okay. emails. <laughs> the ones that come in the way we ask people to send them, I think um, me personally, probably 30, I would guess, 30 okay. or 40. Oh, wow. But then the other editors, they get them directly. So that's, I couldn't say for the press. Sure. But so it's definitely enough, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, that, you know, we can't do everything we could do. Mm -hmm. You know, we publish 150 books a year. Mm -hmm. So if I'm getting that many things a month, I can't say yes to all the best ones right? because I'd still have too many books. Right. So it has to have some shape, some purpose, some like, oh, I want to do this or I want to work with this person or this, we really need this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, I mean, this is a weird question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> in your experience of well mm -hmm. over, of publishing well over a thousand books, um, what is the biggest mistake that you see authors making with their first book? What, what is the biggest mistake? Or the most common, I would say. The most common is underestimating how close to the dissertation it's wise to stick. Mm -hmm. So they think they start with what they have rather than starting with you know, people read books all the time. You can't get through graduate school if you haven't been reading books. So you would think like, just like someone who test drove cars all the time, you'd have an idea of like, well, what makes a car something you would like to drive? This is a very non-New Yorker analogy, <laughs> but here we are. Um, and yeah, like when people come to like doing shaping their own books, instead of going with all that knowledge, of like what they like to read. Oh, it should be funny. It should like pull me along. It shouldn't get bogged down in stuff that like I don't really care about. Like mm -hmm. anything they could say, probably about half their comps list. Um, they just kind of stick with the dissertation, which was built mm -hmm. in this other way, more than is necessary for the readers. Mm -hmm. And I it makes sense because it's there. Often, you know, they're um committee was is very encouraging like oh that's uh, it's really well done it's really polished it's publishable 
as is. And I think that often could be the case in some period, which might not be now. <laughs> and um, publishable versus it's readable. Okay. And where people will be excited about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that part. And then kind of the voice, I think, really goes with that. Mm -hmm. I was like, who is this voice for? Who are we explaining these things to? So I've taken to telling people, you should be writing for the people just entering the graduate program you came out of. Mm -hmm. you know? Like, where are they? What do they want to hear? Don't be writing for the person on your committee who's never going to come around. Mm -hmm. You write, Or, you know, I, I often quote, I think this was Bill Germano who said this, um, too many books are written as if it's the first book somebody's going to read. Like, mm -hmm. let me explain to you mm -hmm. what this Sylvia Winter idea of mm -hmm. yeah, is all about. No, I, I like that, the idea of writing for someone who's coming into the, the grad program you entered. I mean, when I was, um, the, the times when I found not the writing to be the easiest, but like the voice to feel like it was flowing the best is when I, I kept keeping in mind um like the books that had kind of blown my mind in grad school, you know, um, and and sort of had those in the in the back of my mind, and and was like, I, I want to write. I'm trying to write like that. I'm trying to like whatever that thing is, you know, that Herman Gray did in Watching Race. Like I'm trying to do that thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. which um, I think is is a helpful framework. Um, I mean. I mean, I think the hard thing, of course, like with the dissertations, you've done all the work, you know, it's like you've done so much work that, you know, it's it's almost like, what is it? Is it in geometry where like it's not enough to have the answer? You have to show your work. Um, it's, it feels like that. Right. You want to show people how much work you did um, mm -hmm. as if the value is in like the manpower, you know, and, and the hours and the labor. Right. As opposed to the, the argument. Um, but then by contrast. You do that and then you go to like for authors who are now like me working on the second book, you have nothing, you know, like if if you have the, the literal opposite problem, whereas with the, with the first book, you're like, I have all this stuff in my dissertation and I, I can't figure out what needs to be cut out. But then with book two, it's like, oh, it's just me coming up with something now. There there aren't drafts of things sort of in existence. <laughs> um, so what I don't I, I guess what do you see in terms of sort of obstacles for, for authors that you work with, the, the people, you know, like me who um, you published my first book, you will be publishing the second book whenever this book gets written. But what, what do you see as kind of like a common like roadblock or obstacle for, for authors moving from like their first book to the second book? I mean, the biggest problem is that it's not acknowledged as a problem. You mm -hmm. know, so I, I, often compare it to like teaching someone to ride a bicycle. So there are all these programs, including this, on like getting from a dissertation to a book. Then people are like, oh, you're an associate professor. You already wrote a book. You must right. know how to do it. But as soon as you break down the parts like you were just doing, then you realize, well, this doesn't have anything in common. I'm mm -hmm. not revising something. I don't have something to look at and go like, oh, the you know, even the way the dissertation showing the work, that's like, okay, so maybe that's the 20 hours of footage and then finally you beat the film out of it, that's that's different. But then I think with the second book, people often look for something to revise, like, mm -hmm. and so they start trying to move their articles around like they right, were right. pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and mm -hmm. if they got it right, it would form a book. <laughs> or they start writing as if you could go out filming the film without knowing what the plot was going to be. Mm -hmm. And eventually the plot would arrive mm -hmm. so that you have uh, a lot of footage, but it's not necessarily, there's not an arc or there's not something mm -hmm. to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think this fits with one of the kind of real material problems of writing the second book, which is there's not the time and space right. that there was to be with the material. You know, you if you work in archives, there's not the time to spend in archives. If you do field work, there's not the time to go out and be in the field that there was before you were, when you were writing the dissertation. So it makes it more 
difficult to kind of come to what you want to say mm -hmm. in uh, in the time that you have. And if you come to what you want to say, then getting what you would need to actually be able to say that be can, can become a secondary problem. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of times when the second book process drags out, it's because people go on one idea of what they're going to do, then they do a bunch of reading, some time passes, something else seems really important. They start thinking, well, oh, maybe I should do it more like this mm -hmm. and start shifting. Mm -hmm. Then they kind of do a little in that direction. Then some more time passes. Then they get another leave and shifts again. Mm -hmm. And they have a bunch of things that don't cohere at all. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of trying to figure out what you want to say and what genre you want to write in, mm -hmm. even that question for the second book, which is something people rarely stop and ask themselves, is like the first book going to be the same kind of study that the first book was? Mm -hmm. Or is this going to take up a different form? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be more like a long essay? Is it going to be more textbooky is it going to be more um in uh take a different like writerly style and going back and forth how is it going to flow to try and like open out those questions and then come back to be doing the research and filling in you know you probably can't do it before there's some research but to try and get that point where instead of just writing and oh i turned that into an article i turned this into an article it's like yeah you have six good articles there over eight years and they're all in different modes and kind of addressing different yeah. overlap mm -hmm. they have a similar object but they're really in sort of different projects and what kind of book would be a book which had those different projects end right. to end not a very use You're, you'd be better off with just the articles being articles a lot of times so how do you propose then, or what, like, what are your suggestions for folks to car? I don't, it's not even just carving out the time, but you know, how do you develop an argument where you're sort of in the midst of, of like, of doing the research? Because, you know, at least for me, sometimes the, it's in the, it's the process of doing the research and going on the mm -hmm. weird kind of like, you know, like fix, fishing expeditions that mm -hmm. I eventually like spark something and arrive at an argument, but that, that, you know, that's, that's kind of an ongoing ongoing process so what is your advice especially for authors of, of of their second books i think you have to it's it's sort of horrible because the whole tenure process is so procrustean and mm -hmm. you have to like make things fit but it does give you a deadline mm -hmm. and if you have a good advisor as an assistant professor somebody's going like let's walk that backwards what would we need at each stage? Mm -hmm. And you could set up some calendaring for yourself and go, what do I need at each stage? Mm -hmm. For associate professors, there's nobody really to do that except usually the person themselves. Right. So right. then you have to think, okay, I love the exploratory part where I get all out there. When do I have to say, okay, let's move on to the next stage? Mm -hmm. when do I have to then go let's get this plot let's get the screenplay for this kind of plotted out what's the implotment what's it going to look like mm -hmm. when do I need to write because that's not going to come externally and I think that's where people because that process of discovery is what people love mm -hmm. that's where things just begin to shift and you see the project that kind of keeps shifting without ever settling into like some, I am committed to write this book. Right. So, and, uh, you know, I've worked with many writers and know people work really differently. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who just have an inkling that the topic is going to be over here. And if you ask them about why, it's never very convincing, mm -hmm. but they dig down and dig down and dig down. And by the time they're done, you have an amazing book. There are other people who have to like outline the whole thing in advance and then they can write to that. You know, if some people have to, like me, I like to know what it is I'm going to argue and then think like, oh, what would I need? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So people have to get some sense of like what works for themselves. Is mm -hmm. that a writing group where everybody's trying to get, you know, I I have a number of second book authors where I did their first book. They have a retreat once a year. They do, they make like a program of checking in with each other. Do you get like a group like that to try and get everybody across at the same time? Or would that be the wrong thing for you? And you just need to go and say like, okay, this is my time, how I've carved it out of my real life. Another question, but this is my time and this is when I'm going to be writing. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel that authors, I mean, this is a thing that I'm, um, that I'm, you know, thinking about as I'm, as, as I'm working on the, on the second book, um, but <laughs> Should there be sort of a consistency in topic, approach, argument from book one to book two? Um, I mean, I've, I know that I've I've had this sort of experience where I've seen, you know, someone comes out with with a book, their first book, and it's great and everybody loves it. And then they come out with this, the second book, and the second book just doesn't seem to bear much relation to, to the first. Mm -hmm. And that can either be a like, oh, look at sort of how expansive, you know, their their interests are, or it's a like, what is this person doing? I thought they did this. Now they're doing, you know, um, mm -hmm. even within the same field. Um, but how important do you think it is to maintain consistency? Or do you think that can be a detriment because then you're sort of a, you know, you don't want to be essentially writing the same book, the same argument, just with different objects? Well, that it's interesting because at one point, and uh, I only know this secondhand, uh, but at one point there was a, uh, an attempted two books for tenure thing in history at Duke. And they dropped it because the first book would get a, this is a promising new person in the field review. And the second book would be like, disappointingly thin after so-and-so's <laughs> blah, 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 uh -huh. because they were kind of taking the same topic, getting a kind of spin-off book out quickly. Right. So it was like, why would you take somebody who had a promising first book and rush them to do the second book before they could make it as good as their first book? Didn't make right. any sense. Right. You know, if, um, I think they're really different kinds of careers. So there are some people who almost every book they go and they explore something else. And, you mm -hmm. know, you think about Imani Perry, their books are all, they share concerns, they share subjects, but like a first book on hip hop, the book on, you know, there's a whole bunch of different topics and that's great. Mm -hmm. There are other people who are more like, oh, I am building this subfield right here and mm -hmm. I'm going to stay and do it. Mm -hmm. And, but like, uh, if you, there's also very oblique relations you know, like Ashan Crawley's first book, and then the book that we did, The Lonely Letters, you could tell that the same person wrote the two books and had shared concerns, mm -hmm. even though, the, or Riley Snowden's books, you know, even mm -hmm. though the books like had also different audiences or different potential. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that I like where people move and they do something that like exceeds what you expected from them in some in some interesting way. Mm -hmm. And even um, you could have something that you could say, oh, this person has a project. I mean, let's take the most canonical example I could think of, like Sadia Hartman. If mm -hmm. you trace her three books, am I, got, am I missing any? I don't think so. I'm not sure, yeah. Okay, Lose Your Mother, Wayward Girls, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you take those three books, they're all kind of the same project, but they're all kind of, they arrive in a different place, they have different archives, mm -hmm. they have different, and they're pushing people in a very similar direction the whole time. Mm -hmm. So how you show that you're the, you're the author of all those things, Mm -hmm. To me, that's that's a valuable career thing. Yeah. There are clearly other people who are just like, oh, I wrote this short BFI thing on this film, and now I'm going to write this textbook, and you know, all those that that that's not their interest. But I feel like the sense of like people wanting to read you, 
comes mm -hmm. from having something that they loved in the first book show up in the second book. Mm -hmm. And that could be your voice, that mm -hmm. could be your style, that could be the set of concerns, that could be the methodology or the theoretical approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was um, when I was at SCMS, um, whenever that was a week and a half ago. I don't know. Time has no more meaning. Um, I was I was joking with a friend. We were we were just talking about like writing, you know, subsequent books. And I said, Yeah, I'm just I'm trying real hard not to write, you know, double negative electric boogaloo. You know, <laughs> like I don't like that's the thing. You don't want to just um, do the same. You know, do a redux of of, of mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, that's hilarious. Um, <laughs> But but now I'm like, oh, that's kind of a good title. I don't know. I'll save that for, for something else. <laughs> um, you mentioned a couple times um, this matter of voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that in um, when you did a version of this last year, you talked about authors needing to kind of decide, like, what, what's their voice going to be? Is it going to be self-reflective? Are they going to be part of the story? Is it kind of doing the more traditional, like, academic third person? Um and I just I know that just among my my friends um, and colleagues, a number of us have been talking more um, about how to experiment with voice. You know, feeling like you did the first book, it did what it needed to do, it got what it got you tenure, you know, and that's great. But wanting to maybe do something more personal or just sort of play around with sort of style, um, you know. Um, but that's a scary thing, right? <laughs> so what are like? What are the best ways, in your opinion, for, for authors to sort of experiment with or develop sort of new writing styles um, or sort of, you know, a unique voice that they didn't have in their first book? I think there, there are a bunch of ways of experimenting, and especially because there's so many online forums. Mm -hmm. You know, you see some people like you can see Tressie McMillan Cottom's voice on Twitter, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or you could see it in a New York Times op-ed piece, or mm -hmm. you could see it in an actual essay. But my, part of the reason I went to the voice so much, I think, is because there's so many different things to read that are interesting or watch. Mm -hmm. you know? So you, I get good ideas from TikTok, you know, mm -hmm. so what's going to make somebody want to sit down and read a book or your book mm -hmm. and how do you make that a kind of engaging experience but all the sort of shorter form things whether that's blogging whether that's other forms of social media writing um on my um author katie stewart has something that's been going on for years uh, originally in Austin, where on Sundays she would have people come to the, her house and the admission was 500 words. <laughs> you had to bring 500 words to get in. It was very inclusive. And then people would read your 500 words and go make suggestions or give feedback. Mm -hmm. So if you had like three friends who were trying to like, how do we write in a more open way? Mm -hmm. you know getting together you could be doing kind of think pair shares you could be right. doing let's all take this topic and write about it I think Katie's class she would have something like oh we're all going to go for this drive and then write about something you saw along the way that mm -hmm. you know so trying to give yourself permission to open up and then figure out well what form works for you mm -hmm. and Part of, I try not to feel like this is something that everybody has to do because they're just people who have, are more engaged with writing, have more talent at it for whatever reason, have more love of it. That's more their ambition to be more writerly. And other people, it's like, if it's clear and if it's not weighted down, that's already a good achievement. Right. So, but if, if it's something people want to do, it's, for most of us, it's not what we were trained to do. Right, right. And I think some people who are also poets or also write fiction have a kind of leg up on a lot of people because they were already they already have some writing they're thinking about that way. Or if you're doing journalistic writing, and oddly, one of the experiences I've had several times um, 
is getting people who have journalistic experience to feel as free in their academic writing as they are, you know, turning out pieces once a week for mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. public. So how do you convince your, it's partly about convincing yourself to let go and be, feel free that your idea won't get lost if right. you put it in a way that someone wants to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think though, it also goes back to what you talked about um, earlier about having having models for your writing, right? So, uh -huh. you know, you have these academic books that you really loved and then you kind of end up churning out something that's got too many details <laughs> and is kind of dry. But I also, you know, we don't necessarily um, talk a lot in academia about writing. We talk, to, we talk about research and, and essentially the writing becomes the, 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 chosen method to convey the research or to get the mm -hmm. ideas across, but we don't actually talk about the craft of writing and voice and, and things like that. Um, which is why I think it's been really exciting to see um, folks playing around with that one, because it just, I mean, I remember when I was, um, when I sent you an email saying, do you have suggestions for like, who, like, who should I be reading? <laughs> mm -hmm. Who's sort of doing this thing that I would like, you know, uh, that I aspire to do in my own writing, just because it's nice to have you know, actual models of that in scholarship um, when when it's not that that common. Um, I think this is a historical moment, you know, and a good one. And it kind of, I mean, this is something that's really valuable to me, but I feel like the way that social media makes it possible to get books like yours or um, other queer or feminist or um you know politically necessary books out to people who aren't academics mm -hmm. means that we have a different possibility of writing than there would have been at a time where it would be like oh the only people who are ever going to know this book exists are people who go to an academic library or an academic bookstore or go to MLA or <laughs> something mm -hmm. like that and so there wasn't really, there might have been reasons to like like being a good writer, but it wasn't connected. You would, the more normal thing then was to leave the academy. Oh, I'm going to be the right. next Stephen Greenblatt or something. I'm going to try and write for a trade audience rather than academic audience. And what I love now is you can still be doing your work. Mm -hmm. This is a, a quote from Saidiya from, one, just the second or third intellectual publics she was doing with um, Anne Svetkovich on creative nonfiction writing. She, she, after Lose, it's kind of ironic now, but after Lose Your Mother, she was like, that book got so pushed by the editor to try and make it something I didn't really want to do for to be a big trade book. Mm -hmm. I just want to use the writing to do the book that's really my work. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it was Wayward Girls, which was even bigger than that. But. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, that actually leads to something else I wanted to ask. And I, I just want to also, like, note to everybody, like, I, I, I think we're turning to questions at, like, what, 7.45? Is that yeah, what we're, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to let folks know I, I see them popping up um, and in the Q&A. So they're not, I'm not ignoring them. I'm just... Um, gonna, we're going to talk for a little bit more before we turn to those. Um, so you, you brought this up. Um, and I wanted to, um, I mean, particularly because it, it, because thinking about this distinction, or perhaps there is not um, uh, as much anymore, or perhaps there is between sort of academic uh, publishing and and trade press. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, Saidia Hartman's like Wayward Lives and all of the and and a bunch of other books too, I think, mm -hmm. are, are sort of good examples of these um, of these these books that are sort of crossing over in, in, into the mainstream, um, the mainstream, however that's being defined. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm sort of wondering, because I, I don't know, maybe this has always been the case. I just wasn't aware of it or I've become more aware of it. I, I feel like there are a number of academics who are more and more intrigued by the idea of doing a trade press book. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that Duke does both and does, right? Um, but then there are also just straight trade presses, right? Um, in your estimation, what what is the difference between an academic book and a trade press book? Um, what is it a difference in 
language? Is it a difference in the types of questions that are being asked? Because people say it's a difference in audience, but I, I don't actually think that's as helpful um, mm -hmm. as people th think it is. Um, for me, it's it's more of like, well, maybe the trade press book is asking and answering different questions than an academic book would. Um, but how do you see the distinction between between those two? And then as a second part, how does an author, especially I think for for second book authors who sometimes have these ideas um, that are, you know, it's like, eh, maybe this is an academic book, but maybe this could be this other thing too. How do you know which idea goes where? Um, those are a whole bunch of questions of yes. which some <laughs> I have some expertise in and some I do not. I've been really fortunate to publish a bunch of people, Salome Shatilat, Imani, a whole uh, Ashan, a whole bunch of people who then went and got trade con an agent and contracts to do trade books. And, you know, Christina Sharp's Ordinary Notes, which I've read, and it's fabulous and it's coming out from Farrah Strauss after we did her first two books. You know, the scale of that is really different. A trade publisher like Penguin or HarperCollins or Simon and Schuster or random, the random how, I mean, random penguin, it's a big conglomerate of trade publishers, but, um, or even Norton at a more kind of serious end, they have a machinery for getting books out there that even the most tradey university presses, which I would say Chicago, mm -hmm. Harvard, uh, Princeton, um, that even they don't have. And they have money to spend on advances at a scale that university presses mostly will not ever have, period. Um, and they think of that money in a different way because it could just be a write-off. Mm -hmm. It could just be like, oh, we're constructing our FS genus and this is what we want to have. Yeah. Their process is almost always different. It's mm -hmm. almost always through agents. So a lot of times the biggest problem for somebody who wants to do a trade book is getting an agent. And the agent is doing the filtering for trade as a kind of form that I do for my press or other editors do for us or their own presses in university press publishing. And, you know, there's lots of crossover spaces where a book that comes out in trade could have come out from a university press. Um, but there's lots of things that university presses sell a lot of that a trade press would never have taken on. Mm -hmm. And I think the audience can't be ruled out of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think the general audience is actually very useful as a, as a concept. Mm -hmm. But take something that I've seen books go in both ways, like how does feminism turn in from a politics into something that just helps people in business? And isn't that bad? OK, mm -hmm. so you can probably off the top of your head think of three academic books that do that and mm -hmm. some trade books that do that. Mm -hmm. And then what would the examples be? What's the kind of voice of the writer? You know, is this something you would recommend to your mom or a friend's mom or an aunt? Mm -hmm. You know, so that the kind of who is who is it actually centrally aimed at? You know, I can say like we've published more copies of Sarah Ahmed's Living a Feminist Life. We've sold more copies than lots of trade books, so. Mm -hmm. But it's not she didn't have to write it with somebody saying oh, don't use that word or don't right. use this word. And the trade publishers are there to make money. So they, they're they willing to put their money down to have you write the book, but then they want the book that is the commercial version mm -hmm. of the book. Mm -hmm. I, and that could mean that even as much as I'm saying, well, what does a writer need to be convinced for our books? For that, they may not want the writer, they may not want any of that kind of great evidence you found at all. They may just want you to say what you want right. to say. Right. They may not want to know that 
you've read anything else mm -hmm. or they might just want those footnotes in the back if it's a kind of history book or something so they're following their own kind of models and it's also very um I always like wet my finger and put it up like which way is the wind blowing right and right. agents are like that and my friend Tanya McKinnon who's uh, done a lot of the books that I think are responsible for the African-American renaissance in trade publishing now she'll like start any talk I've seen her give by saying you know we know this isn't going to last forever this moment in pub general publishing we've seen this before and trade publishers are going to lose interest but my job is to get as much out there as I can before that happens mm -hmm. you know and there might be a version of that in academic publishing, but it's like much more like, no, this is still really good scholarship. We want to get this out is going to be a motivator rather than, yeah, well, the books we did on that last year didn't do so well. So we're just going to cancel those contracts and get out of here and not do that again. Mm -hmm. And so the frame and the success part and the path are all very very different i mm -hmm. would say okay okay um well maybe they're the ones who are being trendy to use the word that i <laughs> that i used at the at the beginning you know i don't i don't know right. um i mean it, it's it i do think it's interesting as a question i think especially with the <sighs> Not that there haven't always been public intellectuals, but I think with more people sort of having a foot in both worlds, and I think mm -hmm. um, some people becoming sort of like social media public intellectuals too. I mean, they might not have a trade press book, but they have sort of a very large presence on social media. Um, I think these are, you know, kind of this relationship between academic writing and public facing writing. Um, this mm -hmm. continues to be one that I'm sort of curious about. Um, mm -hmm. um, okay. Couple like two, I guess, wrap up questions before we move into into like the questions um, from everybody who's who's tuned in and submitted things. Okay, um, what sort of trends? Not trends. That's not the word. What? That's fine. What, no, 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 I don't mean trendy, but I mean trend. But no. what new developments are you noticing in academic writing and publishing right now that you are particularly excited about? I'm definitely excited about this. How do I use storytelling to make my point, which could be about urban renewal. It mm -hmm. doesn't, it's not just, I think sometimes people think, oh, that's for something that's really creative or fictional, but that could be in something that's about urban experience. It could be about, um, you know, uh, the queer, early modern you know it doesn't have to be just things that are like actually creative in that way mm -hmm. um so i think that i feel that the kind of change in who's in the academy and who's telling what stories mm -hmm. for themselves mm -hmm. has been really huge you know mm -hmm. the last thing we did which was sammy shock and the black disability studies that mm -hmm. was the last intellectual public and like the kind of conversation around that and the people mm -hmm. who are there and they like you know i think i saw her tweet the other day i'm not trying to get like white disability writers to take race into come into consideration more i want there to be more black disabled differently abled people to be writing mm -hmm. and i think that as a kind of general change mm -hmm. has been really good because it means that the things people didn't think of come to the fore. And that's always what I'm interested in. It's like, oh, what if, um, uh, what's her name? Is the woman who wrote the post-colonial love poem, uh, Natalie Diaz, is that right, mm -hmm. the poet? And she was like, in my, la my language, there's no word for tomorrow. There's no, we're going to do this tomorrow. There's no real future thing. You can baby get away with like when I get up, but there's no real future. And it's like, oh, well, what happens when you think that way? Or what happens when the kind of frames move out of the frames that we've had mm -hmm. and there's rethinking? So that's something that I'm I'm always looking for and and excited about. Okay. Um, I guess as a 
maybe this is too big of a question. No, I'm going I'm to ask this question anyway. You probably, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it succinctly, but I'm curious to hear what you say. Um, so when I um, when, was working on double negative and was sort of chatting with people and they said, oh, you know, did you get a book contract? Where's your, you know, and I, where'd your book land? And I said, yeah, I'm going to, it's, it's coming out with Duke. And I, I always remember being at a dinner and, and a, a colleague saying, oh, so you're a Duke girl, huh? And I didn't quite know what to, I was like, well, yeah, you know, but, but it occurred to me that I didn't quite know what they meant by asking mm -hmm. me that. Um, mm -hmm. And so my question, I have a sense of what I think that means now, but mm -hmm. I want to throw it to you, which is what is a Duke book? Well, I love that question because I feel like um, it actually is something which, you know, if you said, what is a Palgrave book? You'd have the next question would have to be, uh, in what field? You mean in com? That's not going to be the same as in lit. So the idea of what makes a Duke book, I think, is we've always felt like if somebody opened up the seasonal catalog, and they read about things they were totally uninterested in, like oh, here's about. Uh, the closing of a birthing hospital in Latin America somewhere, or this, you, you could still figure out why it was a good topic and why somebody would be interested. And the fact that there are four major editors and then two other people acquiring, and it's a kind of smudge of overlapping areas and a kind of synergy across it. I think that's that produces a kind of interdisciplinary conversation and not every book is interdisciplinary mm -hmm. but the kind of the the way the questions are formed you know the thing I always say is like I look for something that if you just said what the object someone was writing about was and what the approach was if I can just predict what it's going to say it's like why do we need this and so that kind of that looking for something that really makes you think differently. I feel like that's the kind of, and we're not the only people who do books driven by that, but I feel like that groundedness, I think we're probably the mix of, not necessarily the ethnographic, because it could be also historical, but that kind of, it shouldn't just be a theory book. I mean, maybe it should be just a theory book if it's like a Membe or something but it shouldn't just be a theory book most of the books are both about something and theoretical mm -hmm. or give you new ideas have a theory um so those those are the things i would say cool thank you for that and thank you for the uh, the conversation um it was really nice to just to hear you talk about sort of your process and your thoughts about publishing and writing, which I always, always love to hear. Oh. So we have in the next 15 minutes, I just want to turn, there's eight questions in the, mm -hmm. in the Q&A and I, I'll double check in the chat to make sure I don't miss anything. So I'll just kind of go, um, I guess, in order um, and I'll just read them to you. Um, right. The first question is by David Shorter. And he says, I'm thinking about Ken's comment that he doesn't think it's useful to hear proposers go on about what separates their work from others. I'm trying to reconcile it with three workshops I've been in that tell us to be sure our proposal has that major section, how our proposal differs from others out there. Does Ken mean in the actual book writing versus the proposal, or is he saying that they don't want that compare contrast section in proposals? Uh, I wouldn't tell you not to put it in proposals, David, because some people obviously think that's important, or at least the people running the workshops. I feel like if I read somebody's summary paragraph about what their work is doing, and it feels different to me, that's going to be more important than something that's going on and saying, this is the first two. Um, you know, oh, there have been things to this approach, but they only dealt with the late 20th century. No one's done it for the early 20th century. I think that would be important if you were a cataloger or you were only interested in early 20th century studies. But for the most part, I don't feel like that really captures the distinctiveness. I think if you say, you know, one thing that I saw as a good trend was when people renamed that section in the proposal from the competition to books you're in conversation with, 
then that's really good. But I would just say, just think of that as the in-class exam. I've known people who like were like, oh, I spent like three or four weeks on that, trying to get it exactly right. And to me, that t three or four weeks would be much better used on the manuscript itself, <laughs> usually. Mm -hmm. Sure. The next one is from Aria Holiday. How much of editorial decision making for university presses or about the ideas versus the money? Is it evaluated differently for first and second book authors? That's a great question because it's actually, I've and I should have said this up front when you asked me about what I do, because I, I really have to think about them together. You know, uh, we as a publisher, pretty popular, university press books still only break even and really only break even as a press because like the digital packages and the journals and the books all kind of add up to breaking even other than Oxford and Cambridge which are huge and do 4,000 books a year and have bibles and t uh, saw handbooks and everything else um I think most university presses either lose money or break even. Mm -hmm. So even to break even, you can't pay no attention to whether things are doing anything. Some books have to hold up the sky. And, you know, that could be like, you know, Christina Sharp or Don Haraway or Lauren Berlant or some things that make it possible for things to sell in much smaller numbers. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, if you're, I'm not thinking about who's going to be interested in this and how and the way of consumption, I'm not really doing my job. So it's not so much dollars as I can't really, it's like readership and circulation. So is this something, you know, do people teach what they write in this discipline? No, mm -hmm. actually, they never do. They mm -hmm. teach from textbooks or they teach only from like online, you know, collections of essays. So you have to think about, well, what is this going to look like if I do this book? And lots of times I think we're like, this is a really important young scholar. They're going to be really important in their field. This book could win a prize. This is going to be great. And then if it takes off so much, the better. But if I did only that, that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. I think on the second book, you could have more of an idea of what the first book did, like uh, this uh, Dr. Gates here, like having done this one successful book, then I could think when I go talk about the next book, I'll say, well, the first book was really successful. So, um, you know, but that doesn't always work out. Sometimes mm -hmm. somebody's first book is really successful more than their second book. Um, and their first books that are some of the most, like that Max LeBoy run book, that are the big successes of any given year or three or four years. So it's a little hard to judge, but um, that would be trying to imagine that who's the readership has to be part of the of what you're looking for. Cool. Next question is from Renee Scott. At what point should we be attempting to propose the first book? I've heard some say that we should hope to graduate with a book contract in hand and others say that you should sit with your completed dissertation for a while before moving to the book. Um, I think who's ever saying you should graduate with a book contract in hand is giving really destructive advice. So I would um, feel free to like tape this once it's up on YouTube and show it to them. Um, one it makes for much worse books and i by accident i discovered this early in my career i was just trying to get started the press was just getting moving and lots of times i wanted to show my commitment by saying i'll write a letter cover letter to go with your dissertation i could send that out to readers now i would never do that i feel like read the readers they read enough dissertations of their own students. They don't need to be sent something from me as a dissertation. But then I was I was trying to do it. And so people would get reports that said what the dissertation had to do. They'd comment on the person's letter 
or what needs to happen for it to become a book. And I feel like if I look back at that set of books, many of them kind of narrowed down what the difference between their dissertation and their book was. They didn't really have that plateau that you were talking about at the beginning, Raquel, where they looked back on what they did and said, oh, since I already got to here, where's the next place I want to go from there? And that made for much worse books. And if somebody was trying to do that even before they had their defense and was already trying to get a contract and they hadn't even gotten the feedback from even their own committee, no less taking it out on the road and going to conferences and getting to see what excited people about their work, I think that would just be, that to me is the neoliberal academy that's like, we see here, but I first encountered in Australia or in the UK, where it's like, it's just the number of things you publish that count. We're, we have no ability to tell a smart thing from a not smart thing or an influential thing from a non-influential thing. So let's just like rate the presses and rate the journals, and then we'll just come up with a number and you know, we'll give you a 12. And so you probably deserve a raise. And she gets a, tw a 20 and she definitely deserves a raise. And this person gets a nine because those were all in feminist journals. And the person who rated the journals didn't know anything about feminism. So, mm -hmm. you know, and this idea that you should be rushing into having something in hand is either desperation, like we're not placing our grad students. Maybe we should ask why. Um, <clears throat> or just kind of setting somebody up into exactly the wrong set of thinking about their own possibilities and their own genius. Like, mm -hmm. Why not encourage them to be smart and actually get out there and change their field? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you, that was oh, a rant. No, no, no. I, I just, I didn't know people were giving that type of advice. I can't, I can't imagine trying to, whatever like send out a book proposal and to dissertate i mean and yeah um okay i'm going to combine two questions um charles and uh jillian's um questions um so jillian's i'll start with this and then it leads into charles's um jillian says in your estimation what if any impact has the academic jobs crisis had on academic publishing and charles question is do you have any advice for career track faculty, such as assistant teaching professors, professors of practice, or lecturers who aren't in conventional tenure track streams? Such lines don't have the same expectations of publishing or clear cut timelines for professional advancement as tenure track lines, which are increasingly disappearing. How is the academic publishing industry working within this new labor context for scholars who may wish to publish with an academic press aren't currently in the tenure stream? So the there's a whole bunch of different possible answers to this and Raquel you can probably throw in some others I would say I paid very little attention to where someone is located mm -hmm. when I signed up their manuscript so they could be adjunctive they could be at a community college they could be you know not anywhere that was like oh this is the person who pay attention because they have this letterhead. That to me isn't really interesting at all. It's the ideas and the context and how much that fits what I'm, I'm interested in doing. Um, but I know that the person who has no support, who has no leave, who has no, you know, even somebody who's just having to spend every year, spend half the year applying for another postdoc, is going to like have less capacity to be writing or thinking about writing than uh, they would have otherwise. Um, I don't think I can solve that. I thought earlier on, and you know, this is still somewhat true, even though it runs against the general trend of things, that the proliferation of postdocs, which was the first solution to the job crisis, was actually good for people writing books, that they had more time to think about it before they got into a tenure track job and weren't teaching and having advisees and everything else and trying to get started at the same time. Um, so 
you know, I think there's all of that. Um, there's, you know, none of that makes the situation actually good for people whose books I know we would really profit from and they don't have the place to stand that they hope to stand to be able to write them and with support that they deserve. Um, and, you know, my, I feel like my job as publisher is to be as encouraging and open to those books as possible. Um, uh, I'm not in the position to actually change the conditions, but we are in a position as we have done to do a lot of books about those conditions and see if those can help get to uh, some better solutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I would just kind of quickly add to is I think um, one of the things that I appreciate about working with with Duke was sort of the appreciation of different, at least of the objects and, and the methods that I was sort of bringing to the table, Part some of which are my own um, things I'm interested in, but also were very much sort of shaped by the conditions of where I was working. Like I didn't have a research leave. So some people get, you know, I mean, I was tenure track, you know, so in a very privileged position. Um, but I certainly, I didn't have a leave, but to, to work on my book, um, and didn't really have any research funds or, or anything else. And I know that there are some, some presses, I would assume, and some editors who get very, um, I, you know, who get excited by certain types of research, but I think just the kind of acknowledgement that not everyone is able to do the same, not everyone can sort of go off site, right? Who has the money mm -hmm. to do that or the ability to leave their family or, you know, whoever they're mm -hmm. taking care of to go do those things. Not everyone has the money to like go dig in archives. Or, I mean, I, I feel like those are also things um, to, to sort of be sort of stated and, and acknowledged. That's um, another thing I should have said with the trade and university press book, because the you could like ask as many authors as you could find and they will all have come come if they didn't finish at the time they claimed for in the contract and needed more time. I'm always like, I would rather have the better book than mm -hmm. have the book on time. Whereas with trade, it's like, oh, if you have a drop dead date of February 2nd and that book's not there February 2nd, they can just drop you mm -hmm. and would. Mm -hmm. and the editor might not do anything with it for six months, but mm -hmm. you still have to do that. And whatever those dates are, that's that's the law. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of working with people in the circumstances they're actually in is mm -hmm. something that we really try try for. We have like a minute, so I'm going to ask one more question. I'm also going to say that is Shani and Micah or Mika your questions? I'm not skipping, but you can find the answers to those in um, the webinar that Ken did a few years ago, how to turn a dissertation into a book. Um, you could, which is available on YouTube, correct? Mm -hmm. I believe Ken. Um, so I want to finish with um, Dimas. Uh, my apologies for mispronouncing your name. Garcia's question: How does a new art author choose the right editor to send their work to? There are editors who fit the work technically based on the fields they work in, the authors they publish. But when there are editors who may not be as neatly squared in the author's fields, but are closer to the voice, style, structure of the books the author wants to publish. That's a great question because I think you have to have some. You're making a long relationship with somebody. It's longer than some like real world relationships go. <laughs> you know, you could be talking to this person for three or four years. You want to feel like you're really comfortable with them. <clears throat> there are places where, look, I just need this book to come out in political science at this place. So I'm dealing with this editor and that's fine. But trying to like find the way to find an editor who gets what you're doing you trust their advice, you feel like you hit it off, you could have the number of conversations you'll probably need to have over years. They'll they'll get they'll not try and turn what you're doing into something you don't want to do, but will be able to explain it to others. That's that's the you know, you can't always achieve that, but that's really what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are things that I come to that going like, you know. I really like this idea, that would be really great, but we don't have any list in that. I can't just do a one-off in classics, you know, even if I think like, oh, your idea of anthropolog anthropologizing Herodotus and going back to see Africa-Europe relations 
would fit what we are doing conceptually because we don't send any books to classics meetings. We don't know anything about what those mailing lists are. So each choice I make, marketing has to kind of follow through and they need to know like, oh, this falls in our area or are we starting a new area? Is that a program? So there will be things that, you know, I could personally like vibe with, but I can't really publish. Mm -hmm. So the, it is a little mix of finding the person who's in enough in the area that they could take it on and the person that you feel like you could talk to both. Thank you so much, Raquel. This was really great. I no, feel, thank you. I could, I, I, I'll come like make a lunch appointment with you or something so we can continue the conversation. But this was, this was really lovely. And thank you so much for your, uh, just your candor and your, your transparency about the process, um, which I know I, I really appreciate. I'm sure everyone else did too. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. And, um, we'll do this again next year. So we'll have a different approach and try and get to some questions we didn't get to this time. But I hope everybody has a good evening and a good rest of term and uh, talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye.